Good morning, everyone. So um, I will be talking mostly about our development of RNA therapies for glioblastoma. Uh, and you have already heard about glioblastoma from Bacchus earlier this morning. I want, and you will hear a lot about this disease during the, this meeting, and there is a clear reason for it. Glioblastoma, which is a most common brain tumor, remains one of the most fatal human diseases as of today. It affects roughly 14,000 adult and pediatric patients in the US only. And despite the very aggressive uh, standard of care that includes surgical resection, radio and chemotherapy, the median survival of the patients remained only around 15 months today, and it has not really changed a lot in the last 35 years. There were only four drugs approved by the FDA during this time period. Uh, now we can talk uh, a lot about why it's so difficult to treat this disease, and Bacchus has already started to discuss this topic, which is extremely challenging, but I would like to uh, emphasize only one point today in this talk. Glioblastoma is a highly heterogeneous disease with very few common mutations and markers, and therefore many in the field believe that there is a need in personalized therapies for glioblastoma patients which might be not really practical for a fairly rare and uh, also very aggressive disease such as GBM. We believe that we really have a strategy, a principle, a new strategy today that would combat uh, um, most of, if not all, GBM cases in adult patients. Let me tell you about it. And I want to start with mentioning this very, uh, very important fact. Until very recently, practically the entire biomedical research has been focusing on proteins and protein coding genes only. And in fact, protein coding genes are only 2% of the human genome, and only a small proportion of them is targetable for therapies. Now, what actually makes the human physiology is so complex, and especially the brain physiology is so complex, is not the protein coding space, but rather the what's so called the dark matter of human genome or non coding space of the human genome that is largely trans transcribed for, to various classes of RNA, what we call non coding RNA or regulatory RNA. Many of these uh, molecules are regulatory. So there are hundreds of thousands of non-coding RNA in the human genome, and that's really what makes us human and very much different from lower organisms. They come in, these molecules come in all sizes and shapes, from tiny to long. They're extremely functionally diverse. For example, they regulate transcription, they regulate mRNA processing, splicing, they regulate protein scaffolding and activity. And they're frequently dysregulated in disease, and particularly in neurologic diseases and in cancer. Now, you all heard about RNA vaccines now, but RNA also provides tremendous opportunities for novel therapeutics. RNA can be a drug by itself. For example, we can replace tumor suppressor RNAs, and RNA can be drug. For example, we can inhibit an oncogenic RNA for cancer. Um, and once we learn how to do it, we can really expand the repertoire of therapeutic targets tremendously, and really the sky becomes the limit. Now, for 20 years, my laboratory has been focusing mostly on one class of regulatory RNAs, microRNAs, and today we have mounting evidence that microRNAs are frequently dysregulated in disease, first of all in cancers, and are involved in all aspects of cancer pathologies. But it also more broad, I can make a more broader statement as it relates to neurologic diseases generally. For example, one microRNA we studied called MIR-122 is a neuroprotective microRNA, frequently downregulated in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. And we are working on the strategies to supplement it, and by supplementing it to the diseased brain, we can reduce the neuronal loss in neurodegenerative diseases. Our top target for glioblastoma is another microRNA called MIR-10B. 
And this is a very unique molecule, not expressed in the normal brain, that becomes highly abundant in practically all adult glioblastoma cases. Uh, its inhibition reduces tumor growth and extends survival in all mouse models of glioblastoma. We have studied this molecule for many years, and today we know a lot about its activity and why it's so essential for glioblastoma cells. It regulates multiple mRNA targets, first of all, those associated with cell cycle inhibition and apoptosis, glioma cell death. It also regulates uh, spliceosomal machinery, and therefore, it globally affects gene expression in glioma cells. It's so important for glioma cell that actually it's gene editing, and it's, I'm talking about the gene editing of a tiny gene. In fact, only few nucleotides are sufficient to eradicate, to kill glioma cells without really affecting, and it doesn't have effect on normal neural cells of the brain. And this provides a rationale for the development of mir 10 b targeting drugs. So our goal is uh, oh, let me illustrate this message here. So here I'm showing you the effects of mirtan b inhibitors. On one panel, I'm showing you the effects on glioma spheroids in vitro of antisense oligonucleotides, mirtan b inhibitors. And on the right panel, there are effects of gene editing in vivo in uh, the GBM mouse model. In both cases, you see that inhibition of mirtan b really uh, uh, in vitro, it kills the cells in vivo. It reduces tumor growth very, very significantly. So again, our goal now is to develop MIR-10B inhibitors. Our focus is on CRISPR-Cas-based genome editing of this gene, which has a number of important advantages. First, first of all, it's extremely potent because of the permanent nature of the gene ablation. This strategy requires delivery vehicle, and we're focusing on lipid nanoparticles for the delivery of uh, the CRISPR-Cas system at the time of tumor resection. And as an alternative backup strategy, uh, the antisense oligonucleotides are also being developed. Now, I should mention that although MIR-10B is especially essential for the GBM, it ha this molecule has also been associated with other metastatic cancers, and most of all with brain metastasis. So the strategy that we develop will be beneficial. It's expected to be beneficial for other metastatic cancers. Also, I want to mention that for the disease as aggressive as glioblastoma, the monotherapy is unlikely to be curative, so one would certainly have to consider multi, multiplex, multiplex, uh, target multiplexing and combination therapy. And we believe that this strategy would allow us such a multiplexing of tar targets. Now, talking about combination therapies and multiplexing of targets uh, brings me back to, to my earlier point of the variety and diversity of really unstudied or very poorly studied regulatory RNAs. Um, we recently identified new classes of regulatory RNAs, uh, particularly this enhancer and promoter RNAs that function upstream of MIR-10B and are essential for MIR-10B the repression in the brain. They, their activity is associated with reshaping the genome topology in the brain. Their inhibition has similar effects uh, in glioma killing to the effect of MIR-10B, and we expect that multi uh, the targeting the several targets, in this case, in the same signaling cascade, will amplify the effects of MIR-10B inhibitors. Now, this really brings me to this major point that I hope you will uh, take home from here, is that non-coding regulatory RNA offer us a broad pipeline of new therapeutic targets, and with recent successes in the oligonucleotide therapeutics and mRNA therapies, we are focusing on neurologic diseases and neurologic cancers, glioblastoma, brain mats, and neurodegenerative diseases as well. We have an IP on therapeutic MIR-10B targeting for brain tumors, and in parallel, we are developing uh, MIR-132 as the major neuroprotective microRNA for diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. 
Now, regarding our next plan steps, we will complete the advanced preclinical studies and GBM animal models, and with the various ionizable and cationic lipids available for, for licensing now for large-scale um, formulation of RNA payloads into lipid nanoparticles, we should be able to initiate the IND program for mir 10 targeting and have the first and to nominate the first mir 10 drug in a matter of a couple years. Thank you very much for your attention and I very much look forward to the follow-up discussions.